Welcome everybody to the three o'clock session on Wednesday, day three of the 2021 Vermont Organics Recycling Summit organized by the Composting Association of Vermont in partnership with the Vermont Agency of Natural Resources. This year's summit is being held during International Compost Awareness Week, the largest and most comprehensive education initiative of the compost industry. I'm Natasha Duarte, director of the Composting Association of Vermont. I'd like to give a really warm thank you to all of our sponsors of this virtual summit. These include Community Bank, Eco Products, Vermont Natural Ag Products, Addison County Solid Waste Management District, AgriLab Technologies Inc., EcoPixel, Nature Cycle, the Vermont Produce Program for the Agency of Agriculture, Food and Markets, and the Eco AmeriCorps Program from the Department of Environmental Conservation. I'd like to invite Ali Kultura to join us now. Vermont Produce Program is our uh, featured sponsor for this session. Ali's the Produce Program Outreach and Education Coordinator. So Ali, if you'd like to go ahead and unmute yourself. So my name is Ali Kultura. My pronouns are they, them, and I work with the Vermont Agency of Agriculture and the Produce Program. And we exist to help grow Vermont's produce industry by helping farms of all sizes and stages of development to meet food safety requirements, access markets, and promote public health as sustainable agriculture businesses. One of our main areas of focus is on farm produce safety. And produce safety is all about protecting fruits and vegetables from becoming contaminated with pathogens that can make people sick. So as part of this work, our program implements the Food Safety Modernization Act Produce Safety Rule in Vermont. The Produce Safety Rule is a federal regulation intended to reduce the number of foodborne illness outbreaks with, associated with fruits and vegetables. Farms that are subject to this regulation must meet requirements for certain inputs, including what are called biological soil amendments of animal origin. And compost is included in the category of biological soil amendments of animal origin if it is made with feedstocks that come from animals such as manure or food scraps that have meat and dairy mixed in. Vermicompost is also considered a biological soil amendment of animal origin. And that is such a mouthful that we affectionately use the acronym BASAO. It's lots, lots of jargon in the produce safety world. Um, so the, the produce safety rule requirements address both compost made on farms and soil amendments that are purchased from third party suppliers. So we can help farms understand whether they're subject to the rule and how the requirements might apply to their operations. Additionally, we can help farms that are exempt from the rule understand and implement best practices for reducing food safety risks. And some farms that purchase soil amendments from third party suppliers may need documentation from the supplier that the amendment has been treated and handled in a safe manner following composting best practices. So we can help compost suppliers understand the treatment and handling requirements of the produce safety rule and provide a template for a certificate of conformance that you can give to growers for documentation. I invite you to check out our website at agriculture.vermont.gov slash produce program for more about, our, about the produce safety rule, farm resources, and our contact information. And I'll also put my contact info in the chat. And you're welcome to get in touch with any questions. Back to you, Natasha. Thank you so much, Ali. And I'll also just say that um, Ali provided a great handout about the Vermont Produce Program rules, which is on the BOR's webpage underneath the, um, their logo, a link to that directly. And I'd also like to just uh, thank Ali again uh, for being a new sponsor of the summit this year. So it's great to have you join the VORS family. Um, so before we get into today's program, just two quick announcements. Um, one is that we are, uh, the Composting Association of Vermont is launching this week a multi-generational statewide art challenge called Changing Lives Through Compost One Scrap at a Time. And this was based on our 20, or sort of stemmed out of our 2021, a food scrap story calendar that features really neat photographs of um, taken from uh, countertop, food scrap bowl um, that Paul and Winsong Kervik took pictures of and, and worked with me to put it into a calendar. Um, we also had um, sort of motivated or inspired by the calendar pictures. A four-year-old uh, saw them and did her own food scrap art here in the, in the plate. 
and um, and they shared those back with us. And then I also wanted to just show some different variation in art that could be done perhaps with food scraps or yard waste. Um, these two posters were actually submissions from UVM's compost ecology and management class for the International Compost Awareness Week, la uh, week last year, so 2020. And I thought they were just really creative. We've working with a, a large number of really great partners on this project to support this outreach and, and educational activity. If you'd like to get involved, um, please feel free to reach out to me directly or check out more information on the Composting Association of Vermont webpage. And I will be putting a link to this project directly in the chat afterwards. Now on to today's program. Um, we are here at the three o'clock hour and we're gonna be hearing about improved compost fertility characteristics, thermophilic and vermicompost blends. Joseph Gorris is an associate professor of ecological soil management at the University of Vermont. His current research interests include earthworm invasions, composting, soil erosion, and mitigation of nutri nutrient pollution with mycophytoremediation. Joseph earned his PhD at the University of Manchester Institute of Sciences and Technology and has an MS degree in natural resources science from the University of Rhode Island. So Joseph, thank you very much for joining us today. We'll look well, forward to- for having me. Yeah. And thanks for the, the uh, introduction. Boy, I do a lot, don't I? Um, <laughs> it doesn't seem that much when you're in the middle of things. But anyway, I'm, uh, I'm looking forward to speaking to all, to all of you and introducing a couple of things about uh, vermicomposting. And I cannot resist to also bring in the worms, uh, so vermicomposting, but also some a very, very brief sort of mention of invasive earthworms. That's because that's part of what I do. So, you know, it, it, it always creeps in. So, uh, first of all, I'd, I'd like to thank my co presenter who is not here because he is in Turkey. So, it's a long way away, it's about seven hours difference. Uh, so he, he couldn't make it today. Uh, but this is really, uh, Korkmaz Beliturk is, uh, is, is a great friend, but he's also a great collaborator. And, and he, was, uh, he was doing most of the legwork on the, I shouldn't say legwork, but it wasn't so much running around and uh, uh, lots of measuring um, these blends or the, the fertility characteristics of the thermophilic and vermicompost comp blends. So I'd like to mention him and then, also, um, ah, where does, does it work? Come on, move. Oh, there you go. Uh, so, um, uh, Turkey is um, a great place to go if you wanted to know more about vermicomposting. Uh, when I was there about five years ago, last time I went, and I really want to go back because it's a great country and a nice, I mean, I don't know, great country and, and people are super nice there. Um, uh, Turkey is incredibly, or I should say Turkish entrepreneurs are incredibly interested in vermicomposting. So when I was there, you know, my friend Korkmaz dragged me around to about six or seven places uh, in a county uh, that's probably the size of, of Rhode Island, maybe, yeah, Rhode Island probably. There were six or seven places that were doing vermicomposting. And Korkmaz was saying, you know, uh, these guys do really well, but they're not really, they're not really in, into uh, vermicomposting at all. They're into producing worms in the vermicomposting bins because the worms were selling at a, at a premium of about uh, 50 cents a piece. And uh, because there was a lot of people trying to get into vermicomposting, uh, there was a really high price on, on the worms at that time. That's pretty amazing. So Korkmaz is actually uh, the character here on, um, on the right hand side of that photograph. So why am I interested in composting? You should know, you should know this as well. So as you, as you know, I, I do uh, uh, ecological soil management as, as part of what I teach and um, what I research. Um, and so the reason why I do this is because I have this, this really and I'm sure that you share you share this view, uh, this really um, scary thought 
once in a while I wake up in the middle of the night and say, where's all that food going? You know, it's going to the city and hardly any of that. So here's, you know, here's your, here's your harvest, there's the big city, there's that big arrow of food going there, and then there's this tiny weeny arrow going back towards the field. So there's not much coming back from the plate to the farm. And uh, so one of the reasons why I'm interested in this is because I want to see that, that back arrow to grow. Okay, so word of warning, composting is great, right? Uh, we have to look at, at nutrients a little bit. Uh, if you add too much, uh, too much of compost to your, to, your, uh, to your garden or to your field, you might actually end up with an environmental problem. If you look at, this is, this is my garden. So, you know, mea culpa, I'm, I'm just as bad as anybody else. Um, I add my own compost, mainly food waste uh, and wood chips. And uh, if you look at that, look at my phosphorus, it's totally excessive. Uh, 63 parts per million um, when they recommend four to seven, way, way over the top. And uh, do you think, do you think my compost is bad? Uh, or my, my garden is bad? You go to a typical community garden where they, where they do their own composting and where they amend a lot more than I do. And that's you know 137.4 uh, parts per million of phosphorus in there. And it's also way excessive. Um, so something to think about, right? So with your composting. So, so much phosphorus, how did that happen? And uh, here's, I show you composting in France. So there's three different kinds of composting. Uh, ways of composting that, that, that I have used. So it's vermicomposting, thermophilic composting. So you, heat, you allow, this is a typical um, windrow type composting and then bokashi, which is a Japanese form of, of composting that uh, seems to be becoming more popular right now around, around Vermont and New England. And bokashi is really all about fermenting your food waste, right? So rather than having it decompose the aerobic way, you're decomposing it in the fermenting way, which means that when you take the food waste out of your fermenter, uh, which is usually just a big bucket, um, the food waste still looks like food waste, it looks like just like you, you had it when you put it in there, uh, except for it smells delicious, like compost, uh, like, uh, you know, pickles. What I'm trying to show here, other than there's, there's these three, three ways of composting that, that I have worked with, uh, is that there, that there are vastly different uh, nutrient profiles to them. So if you look at the vermicompost, and I, I call vermicompost hot and fast, right? So it, it, it's super hot in terms of having nutrients in it. Um, and uh, when you apply it, then the plants respond quickly to it, unless you do something wrong. And I'll tell you about that in a second. But I'd like you to look at just look at the nitrogen here. So vermicompost has, this, this is total inorganic nitrogen, this is plant available nitrogen. Uh, this is parts per million again. So uh, it's 4,765, 4, actually parts per thousand, sorry. It's 4.7 parts per million of ni in, inorganic nitrogen. Compare that to the thermophilic compost, it's like a hundredth of, it's hundred times more in the vermicompost than there is in the thermophilic compost. And then if you look at the Bukashi, it's somewhere in between, but it's still pretty high. It's really got a good, good load of, um, um, of nitrogen. The way this splits up is that for the vermicompost, which is after all a, uh, an aerobic process, you have a lot more nit nitrate than ammonium in your available nitrogen. And you compare that to the Bukashi, which is the fermented anaerobic composting, uh, it's got a lot more uh, ammonium than, than nitrate. So it's kind of reverse in, in, in the species of nitrogen that's available to the plants in these two cases. But here's your thermophilic compost, and I call thermophilic compost slow and cool because it has to be decompose, it takes, it, it takes its sweet time to, to get, get to the plants uh, and so on. So what's really important about this regarding this question, there's how much phosphorus, 
how did that happen? Um, is to look at the ratio between inorganic nitrogen or between plant available phosphorus and plant available nitrogen, which is just this number here divided by that number. And we look at vermicompost, at the P to N ratio is 0.57. The thermophilic compost, 20.6. That's crazy high. You know, you that's worse than manure, right? Uh, so the question is, how does that happen? How how does this, why is it, why is that thermophilic comp compost so enriched in phosphorus? And so if you look at the nitrogen cycle, um, and you look, you look at, at all the reds, the reds are losses. You notice, well, first, the first loss is harvest, right? So all, all your cations and, and nitrogen and phosphorus are, are removed with, not all of them, but you know, a lot of them will be removed with, with harvest. So over time, unless you put stuff back, uh, your patch becomes less uh, fertile. But then there's volatilization, which is ammonium. If the pH is too high, uh, ammonium is volatilized out of, out of the soil. And that means also out of compost, if you want to think about it that way. And then uh, for nitrate, there's actually two big losses. One is denitrification, which is the loss of nitrogen back into the atmosphere as N2. Uh, actually, uh, some of it might, might go up as N2O, uh, so the, the, the nitrogen as a greenhouse gas. And some of it leaches, right? So when you have an anaerobic process, this... Um, this process going from ammonium to nitrate is actually encouraged uh, by by that and uh, by uh, the aerobic uh, by the aerobic nitrogen cycle, um, and that means that you 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 have a good chance that there's denitrification going on should the soil wet up again, and there's a good chance of leaching. And so this is these are the losses that you can see um, happen in thermophilic compost. Right, so uh, it's exposed to nature. It wets up. It dries. It dries down. Uh, there's rain comes along. It wets it up. You're going to get denitrification. So you get you get all these losses in nitrogen. The the thing is that phosphorus doesn't get lost so easily, right? So it's it's usually stuck on surfaces of uh, of of soil particles or or organic matter in in compost. So it doesn't move easily. And the other thing that doesn't happen to it, it, does, it doesn't have a significant amount of, um, of gases. So there's no gas loss, right? So this basically whatever phosphorus you have stays there. Um, whereas the nitrogen goes down. And so that basically means that the ratio between phosphorus and nitrogen goes up. And so with thermophilic compost, it's, it's uh, for the thermophilic compost that I had, it was through the roof. There's some some stuff you might be able to do with this, uh, do about that, uh, but we don't have really much time to talk about that right now. You can probably add it onto the questions later. Okay, just just in case you you forgot what thermophilic composting is about, you're probably very familiar with that. You ha either have windrows or you have uh, aerated static piles. You try to bring get the oxygen in there so that uh, decomposition can occur. When it occurs, it heats up the pile and thereby sterilizes, um, sterilizes the, uh, the compost. And, and by doing so, you're also changing the microbial community. Uh, one important thing that, that you need to know about is this, this balance between moisture and oxygen or moisture and the atmosphere. So if you have a compost pile, you want to be somewhere in the middle where, uh, where there's a lot of pore spaces that are still oxygenated they contain a uh, compost atmosphere, if you want. And, um, and you want to have a lot of spaces that have moisture in them as well. So you want to be somewhere in the middle because the moisture goes, the moisture goes with, um, with the diffusion of nutrients within the pile and of other substrates like dissolved organic materials. If there's, if there's no, uh, no water in, in the soil, there's no diffusion of that to uh, places where that's needed, so where microorganisms are breaking down the compost. And you need the oxygen diffusion, so you need these, these air spaces in the compost so that oxygen can diffuse to those, those very same places uh, so that the um, microorganisms can actually break it down. So this, this is really important. Uh, if you have too much moisture, 
then you're going to get denitrification occurring, um, which is one of the losses of nitrogen. Just to give you a quick idea what Bukashi is about. So here's your food waste. It's already been fermented in a big, in a big barrel or in a, in a bucket. Uh, and then one thing that you have to do with Bukashi, you actually have to dig a ditch and uh, deep enough so that um, any kind of vermin or a dog running around the neighborhood can't dig this nice smelling food up, right? So that's that's one of the, the problems with Bukashi. You actually have to um, help help yourself to its benefits by putting it in a ditch, right? So otherwise you, you're gonna have all sorts of problems with, uh, with animals trying to, to, to eat this. All right, so vermicomposting, some people call it black gold and some people call it fool's gold. Uh, I like to stick with the black gold and I give you, give you a reason why, if you're careful, then it's really black gold. Um, so one reason why you call it the black gold, so in Turkey, so this, this poster is from Turkey, uh, it says uh, the magic of soil and we have little vermicomposting worms there doing, doing their work. Um, and uh, the company that puts this up is called Sia Alten, and that means uh, black gold, actually. So um, anyway, that's a, that's a word over here, too, a term that's used for vermicompost. And the reason why that is, in Turkey, it was people that I saw, it was about the worms and selling tons and tons of worms to people who want to do vermicomposting. But uh, over here, it's... Uh, Vermicomposting is about 10 to 20 times more expensive than uh, per yard, so measured in a volume, uh, than, um, than thermophilic composting. So it's a lot of money can be shifted that way. Um, so vermicomposting basically provides really high quality compost, and therefore it's also very expensive. Um, and uh, it's done with fast feeders, fast breeders. So Icenia fetida, the red wiggler, is your fast feeder and fast breeder in this case. Uh, really, really useful worm. Uh, it's uh, the vermicomposting industry makes use of its ecology. Uh, it's a worm that likes to be at the top of the, of, uh, at top of the soil, uh, in this case, on top of the vermicomposting bin. So you can just, you can just harvest the, you can harvest your vermicompost from the bottom and then replenish that bin from the top and the worms will just automatically move into Whatever is whatever you put on top. Uh, here's a, here's just a couple of examples of that. Here's a, here's a view of um, I think this is Tom Gilbert's machine. Um, and so what basically happens? You this is full of vermicompost, and after about forty to fifty days of the vermicompost moving down and down and down, why does it move down? Because you're harvesting it. Well, for, it takes forty days. Uh, to empty one of these bins. You never really empty it because you keep feeding stuff back in there. But uh, you, you, you're drawing a, um, a knife through here above, above a, a pretty coarse screen and that kind of pushes the, the finished vermicompost down. That gives you, gives you about two inches of space at the top, which you then fill with fresh uh, food waste, uh, whatever you have, whatever your recipe is, food waste, uh, uh, pine bark, or whatever you have as a, as a mixture of, of in your feedstock. And so really big, big places like here's uh, Worm Power uh, in New York. Uh, they have millions and millions of, of worms in here and a lot of machines. So one of the research questions I had early on uh, was, could vermicompost replace Chilean nitrate as an amendment to ameliorate uh, early nitrogen deficiency? So as you know, Chilean nitrate, I think is still, is still uh, available here as an organic amendment in, in Vermont, but uh, in many places around the nation, it, the, the, the uh, organic certifying agencies uh, have excluded it because it's not really a sustainable product because it comes out of, out of a desert that's being dug up. Uh, so the Atacama Desert, um, and so it does a lot of the production of that Chilean nitrate does a lot of ecological damage in those in those deserts. So again, this is a comp quick comparison between uh, vermicompost and thermophilic compost, um, and uh, look at the vermicompost. It's, so this is in percent now; it's no longer in parts per million, but it's it's that nitrate that that I was after in in this in that particular research project. So 0.49% is nitrate, 
And then you have for the thermophilic compost, it's only 0 0.076. Nitrate is really fast, fast acting. Uh, it allows the plants to, to uh, uh, pick it up really quickly. And therefore, if you have a nitrate or a nitrogen uh, deficiency in the springtime, which oft often happens in organic farming, you have something to feed to the plants. So uh, this is what that looked like. So we we have Swiss we have Swiss chard uh, that was one of uh, one of the products. And if you look at the the image on the left hand side, uh, actually I should tell you what we did. So we at planting we provided twenty percent of the nitrogen the annual net nitrogen requirement uh, as vermicompost to replace chillin nitrate. So chillin nitrate is usually also added at twenty percent of N requirement at the beginning of the season. And so uh, that staff that you see there is uh, 90 centimeters, so three, three feet. Uh, and this particular patch here is the one that was amended, is one of the four, um, one of the four plots that were amended with vermicompost. And down on the other side here, you see one that's amended with um, thermophilic compost. The, the, a poorer cousin of vermicompost, if you want, and there's a big difference. Um, so we had we had Swiss chard leaves here that were that were about 80 centimeters uh, tall. Uh, this was on a on a silt, silty clay loam, and then if we go this go to another site, we had another site where we do the, did the same thing. We tried to grow uh, Swiss chard, and this this is at the beginning of of the, the season. Um, not so much towards the end, but you can already see differences. Uh, these blue uh, rectangles delineate places with uh, vermicompost amendment. And so you see a lot more green there than anywhere else in, in this field where we might have put therm thermophilic uh, compost. Um, so even here on this very sandy soil, the plants are doing a lot better. And if you translate that into, I'm not sure whether you can see that because it, at the moment, my my screen has my picture in the way, and everybody else's picture also. That's better. Um, so this this is um, a graph of the yield that we got from uh, the Swiss chart at uh, Bella Farm. That was the first. That was the picture on the right hand side with the really big leaves, and we had a control that there was basically a, a chilling nitrate. Then we had a control with thermophilic. That we had a thermophilic treatment and a vermicompost treatment. Uh, the lines in, this, in the middle of this rectangle is really the, those are the means of, uh, of the yield. And so the yields were about 70% greater for the vermicompost than for the thermophilic. So there's a, there's a lot to be said for vermicompost, except for that it's also very expensive. And so um, I decided that it might be a good idea to see what happens if you kind of dilute that vermicompost down, that really hot and fast or fast and hot compost and dilute it down with some thermophilic, the slow and, uh, and cool compost uh, and see what happens. Maybe, you know, maybe there's some kind of synergy that's going on between them. Um, so that's actually, I'm, I'm jumping ahead of me, but um, so I want to quickly have a, a word about fool's gold, right? So we, we figured out that there is black gold. You can make a lot of money. And if you use use the black gold wisely, you can get green gold in, in the form of a Swiss chard. But there's also this other thing, uh, fool's gold, right? So let's see. Uh, so you may know that, there's, uh, that there are earthworm invasions into forests here in Vermont. And uh, the invasions are by European and Asian earthworms. They do pretty much the same. So you have to be very cautious on what kind of earthworms you are selecting for your vermicomposting projects. Uh, and so the only, the only really uh, safe one to use is Arsenia fetida, the red, red wiggler. Make sure that if you do vermicomposting, you get pure cultures of Arsenia fetida. If you buy anything from further south than the Charlestown Moraine, so further south than uh, Long Island, um, you are likely to get uh, a mixture of worms. So there might be 90% Icenia fetida, but you're also likely to get about 10% other worms. And some of those are invasive. Um, okay, so 
that's my word of warning. Actually, I should should give you another word of warning about this. The the uh, industry that sells worms here in the United States sometimes don't really know what what they what they're doing. So I gave a talk to uh, I give a talk every year to uh, folks in Connecticut, uh, master composters, and uh, one year the person who organized that. Uh, that talk uh, brought, she always brings in worms so to, to share the worms with, with the participants. And she brought five pounds of red wigglers or what she thought was red wigglers. And it was pure cultures of perionix excavatus or Malaysian blue. And those, those are invasive species, 100%. And uh, the folks that, that sold them to her said, oh, we didn't know there was a different species. We got it from a supplier out West, blah, 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 blah. So. Uh, you have to be really uh, cognizant in what you're doing uh, when you buy worms. There, there are outlets that are better than others. And just uh, just to give just to give the Asian earthworms, so the latest wave of of uh, invasions here in Vermont, a little um, shout out. Uh, well, you know you can buy those online. They are actually restricted species in a few states in, in, the, in the US, but you can nonetheless, you can buy those online. And in the old days, there would not, the, those people that were selling them would not even mention the fact that, that these worms might be uh, invasive. So now they, they actually have something in there. It says, update environmental concerns of Alabama jumpers. It should be noted that Alabama jumpers is surrounded by some controversy. Well, the controversy is settled, right? But they still have this on there. We know that they are highly invasive and you should not buy them. Uh, nonetheless, these people are saying, uh, the allegations continues to imply that the Alabama jumper seriously dis interrupts natural food chains at its most critical level. Uh, but then it's really up to you to make that decision. So it's, they're playing a game of scruples with you. Uh, and in the end, they say, it's not our fault. If this happens, uh, it's on you. So uh, beware of these people. And just to make sure that that uh, anybody in the thermophilic composting community says, "Oh, we're better than that because we are uh, we we're, we're getting our compost piles really high," uh, there have been there have been quite a few reports of uh, compost bags that were opened um, from suppliers in Vermont uh, where the snake worms were they were in there, and so this is one one of the the reports we got. Uh, so Miss uh, Miss Y opened an intact bag of blah 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 compost left over from last year and found one of the large worms in it. So it was an intact bag, uh, and nobody can say that uh, this just snuck into the bag. So beware. Um, so another word of warning: if you just use vermicompost, uh, pure vermicompost. Um, as your sole nutrient input. Yeah, it's great stuff. It's really high nutrients, but it's way too high nutrients to use 100%. So the, the recommended amount of nitrogen is about 10 to uh, to 20% of the requirement for the crop. Uh, an, eighth, an eighth to a quarter of an inch um, is, is the other sort of guideline. So Vemicoms is very expensive, but it has these amazing properties. So first of all, it's got high nutrient content. But it also uh, helps with um, with making soils more resistant, or you're more resistant to plant to plant diseases. So, so if you add vermicompost, apparently you can lower the amount of 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 uh, disease, bacterial and fungal disease on on plants. And if you want to know more about that, I think Dr. Nair, Deborah Nair at UVM is a great place to start. Um, I don't have to show this, but uh, basically this kind of tells you more about, or it kind of enforces what I just said about um, about uh, bacterial suppression, fungal dis uh, disease uh, suppression of um, by, by vermicompost. So here's the blend experiment that you all came 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 here for, and. Uh, so the big research question was, can the hot and fast vermicompost speed up the decomposition and nutrient release of slow and cool thermophilic compost? And uh, let's have a look. So again, here's, here's the data, right? So uh, what if we 
we blended the two compost at different ratios. Is there a ratio that's better than another? Um, what would be the outcome of this blending, right? So this is basically what we're after. Uh, and again, I'm, I'm kind of eyeing the nitrate and the phosphorus here. So we had uh, several treatments. Um, so we had one line of treatments with Coar. Uh, what is that? Um, uh, fiber from, from coconuts, sometimes known as coco peat. And then uh, also one, one set of treatments without uh, coco peat. And uh, then we, we adjusted the vermicompost fraction from zero to 30 to 50 to 70 to 100% in both of these treatments. And we, the reason why we added the qua is because we wanted to aerate the blends. So the more aeration, the more decomposition uh, you can expect. We want to see whether, does this make a difference? Does the core make a difference uh, to, the, uh, to the emergent uh, nutrient uh, concentrations? Uh, we constructed, constructed pots. They received about 800 grams of dry mass uh, and so that included the vermicompost, the thermophilic compost, and if we had core in there, it would also have included the 240 grams of core. Uh, we had four replicates per treatment, and then we added, once we are done with constructing these, these, uh, these pots, uh, we, um, we added water to about field capacity. And so this is when things start happening, when you add the water, right? So remember, do I have that here? Do you remember this thing here coming up somewhere? I have it. Do you remember this here? So without without water in these in these dry substrates, you just have oxygen diffusion, but you don't have any of the substrate that is needed for the bacteria to uh, to start consuming and breaking down the uh, the composts. So you needed to add water so to a certain point, so that that you have substrate diffusion so that the bacteria and fungi can do their thing. Um, and, but you want to be at a point where there's still oxygen diffusion happening. So field capacity is really the, the answer to that. And then we measured electric conductivity, uh, which was an overall measurement of nutrients. Uh, we also measured inorganic nitrogen water extractable phosphorus and water extractable K. So these water extractable frac fractions are really uh, what is available to, to the plants right away. And we also measured some enzymes to see whether we can explain something, uh, whether enzymes make a difference. So uh, there has to be some little bit of math here. Uh, so if you, if you math adverse, then you can switch off and I explain things simple way later. Uh, but if you like math, then stick with me. So if you have, if you blend two things, you expect, um, you expect there to be, uh, you expect that, that to have, if you, you have, if you blend two things, you expect uh, the outcome of that blending to be sort of an additive process, right? So that uh, if you have uh, a certain con concentration of one thing and a concentration of the other thing, then the blend ratio should and, and those concentrations should be able to tell you what should be able to predict what the concentration of uh, of the outcome is. And so here's an ex example of that. If I have 70% vermicompost and 30% uh, thermophilic compost, I multiply the 70% to the night. In this case, it's the nitrogen content of one and plus. Um, plus 30% times the nitrogen content of the other divided by 100%. And so you expect the blend to be somewhere between um, between 0.49 and 0.76, but probably closer to 0.49 because there's just more material that has that 0.49 property. So we expect that blend to be 0.57. So that's the expectation if there was a linear uh, combination of these, these uh, two components. So uh, by knowing what what our um, what our blend ratios were and what our chemical properties were of the vermicompost and thermophilic compost, we should be able to predict this number, right? Um, so, in order to figure this 
figure this out a little bit more, we, we said, well, we're going to measure these outcomes and we can, ex we can predict what the outcomes should be if this was a linear process. So if I do the difference and, and I divide that by the measured component, I get sort of a percent deviation from that expectation, right? So if that D, this, this deviation is less than zero, then, then, the, then there's antagonistic interactions happening. If the D is greater than zero, then you have synergistic interactions. If D, if D is equal to zero, then the blends act like blend, like a blend without interacting components. So it would act like, just like what this prediction would be. So the first thing we looked at is, is electric conductivity and uh, each one of these lines. So here we have on the Y axis, we have electric conductivity and vermin composed on the, on the X axis. And again, electric conductivity is sort of a proxy for total nutrient content. Um, so each one of the lines that we have here corresponds to days after adding the water to, to those pots. And so by adding the water, we are activating that, that system. We're making sure that that system is, uh, is properly primed to, uh, for both uh, the substrate diffusion and the oxygen diffusion into, into the pots. Right, so in the beginning, so that this line at the bottom here is after zero days. So it's at the beginning, we added the water and, and there was no difference between any of the blends. So the vermicompost, 100% vermicompost just looked just like the 100% uh, vermi, uh, sorry, thermophilic compost. Then after one day, it kind of goes up a little bit. And then after three and seven days, you have re, these steep curves. And we didn't go any longer than that because after seven days, uh, the vermicompost numbers were off the chart. We couldn't measure it anymore. It was beyond the, the, beyond, the, beyond the instrument that we were using. So that's without QA, with QA. In the beginning we have, so again, the, this bottom line here is, is essentially uh, um, flat. This after zero days, after one day, there's, it's probably flat as well. We actually checked whether the slope was uh, greater than zero then, or greater than, yeah, greater than zero. But that would have probably no, no difference. And then again, uh, after three days and seven days, you have these steep increases uh, with vermicompost. Uh, so how about uh, effect of vermicompost percentage on and qua on plant available nitrogen? So this is what it looks like. So as you as you're moving towards the higher vermicompost uh, concentrations, you get more nitrogen. This is available nitrogen, so this is ammonium plus, this is ammonium plus a nitrate. Um, you get more available nitrogen produced. And then with the core, you get a lot more than with, without the core. So especially in the beginning, look at this at 30% with the core, we have a huge increase in available nitrogen uh, compared to what we started off with. Or, or, so with, with what is in the, uh, in, in the thermophilic compost, which is this pile down here. Uh, and so the, the core is, is adding, is either adding something or it's doing something to, to the process. So what about that antagonism and synergism? So we, here we, on the, X, on the Y axis, we have the deviation from the expectation. Uh, and there's two cases, A is with, um, is uh, with QA and B, this one here is without QA. And so in the, for the vermicompost addition with the QA, which is, which is uh, A, we immediately have synergism. We are, the amount of nitrogen that's available is always higher than, if you look at 30, 50 and 70%, it's always higher than, uh, than what we expected for that blend. So we have, we have synergism between these two, actually, I should say between the three blend components, the vermicompost, the thermophilic compost, and the core. And if you go over to the uh, blends without core, then we only see, we only see uh, real effects at 50%. So since, or I should say not real, we see an synergistic effects at 50%. At less than 50%, we see um, 
we see antag antagonism. So one of the reasons why you might see antagonism here is because coir is a high C2N ratio substrate uh, material. And that means that some of the nitrogen that's being produced might actually be immobilized on, on the coir fibers. Uh, the bacteria like high C2N ratio, so they start growing, growing really rapidly on the coir and they pick up, uh, this is actually without coir, sorry. Without the coir, there's, not, there's nothing happening, but the same goes for the vermicom vermicompost versus the, uh, the thermophilic compost. Here, the, the thermophilic compost, which has a higher C2N ratio than the vermicompost, uh, might be picking up some of that nitrogen. So you have to add more vermicompost to boost that process. Phosphorus and potassium are always higher than, uh, than the deviation. So again, remember this is water extractable phosphorus and, uh, and potassium. So it's not the total phosphorus and potassium, but water available, so water extractable, immediately available phosphorus is greater, uh, in, uh, is greater for both the coir and the, and the without coir treatments, same for potassium, but with coir, for the 30 and, and 50 uh, percent, the phosphorus, that's vermicompost addition, the phosphorus is, is greater for the coir, but then it's the other way around when you go to, to 70 percent. And that's pretty much the same in the potassium. So what might, what might explain this? So one of, one of the guesses is the enzymes, right? So enzymes uh, is basically, uh, basically products of, micro, uh, of, of mi microorganisms and uh, I'm showing you. Uh, that's how they that's how they do their business of, of breaking things down. They have enzymes, uh, and so I'm showing you um, two cases or two two enzymes. One is, one is called a peroxidase, that is associated with lignin decomposition. So lignin, very difficult to decompose generally, and then beta uh, glucosidase, which is uh, associated with cellulose. Uh, breakdown. So if we're looking at enzyme activity, so how fast is the stuff produced? Um, how fast does it, how fast does the peroxidase and the beta glucosidase break down certain model compounds? Um, then we find that as we, for the peroxidase, uh, regardless of whether you have no quar, which is the orange, or whether you have with quar, which is the blue, uh, the peroxidase is more active as you add more uh, vermicompost. So in, in vermicompost, you have about twice the amount of peroxidase as, as you have in the, um, as you have in the, uh, the thermophilic compost. For the beta glucosidase, so the, the stuff that breaks down cellulose, it's even more um, Pronounced. So if you look at going from zero to 50% vermicompost, you have an increase of, of 100, well, actually 1000%, right? So it's about 10 times, a 10 time, uh, 10 times increase in beta glucosidase um, activity. And that goes for whether you have qua or no qua. So uh, people think that uh, lignin and cellulose are so the the gatekeepers to all the nutrients. So if you can break those down, then then the nutrients will um, will come. And so this might be one of the explanations that the vermicompost microbial community has an effect on the amount of enzymes that are available to break down cellulose or um, uh, or lignin. So another one uh, is that the core adds another dimension. So yeah. So guess one is this this enzyme breakdown. Uh, breaks so the end so coir is full of cellulose and lignin, right? So maybe uh, the coir is breaking down itself, increasing the amount of um, the amount of nitrogen, phosphorus, etc. Um, but the other guess with, that has to do with coir is that coir opens up the structure of the compost to allow more aeration and thus more decomposition. Again, this is. This is that that graph where you have to think about uh, what is the what is the best soil moisture content uh, for your um, for your compost pile, right? So that you have both substrate diffusion, 
so dissolved ox dissolved uh, organic uh, compounds moving through the compost pile and you have the oxygen able to enter the compost pile to fuel uh, the decomposition of of the substrate so that's the other that's the other guess and that's so the guess that's that's what what our first first thought was when we're blending things there's another another effect is that uh, that the vermicompost nutrients that are already there fertilize that that uh, blend, right? So if you, as soon as you add the vermicompost, you are adding nutrients, and that might be so priming the microbial community that is in the um, in the thermophilic compost, and therefore you're you're growing you're growing those those comp, uh, those decomposers. And uh, therefore, you're breaking things down more. And so that's, by the way, that's that's nothing new. It's 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 been used in bioremediation. If you have a an oil spill, uh, which is basically carbon uh, without any nutrients, you're adding nutrients to make the microbes active and grow. So, regardless of the mechanism, it seems to work. And with that, I'll uh, answer questions. Thank you so much, Joseph. It's very sure. interesting work. Um, we did have a couple questions that come in. One was whether wood chips could be used instead of coir. Uh, good question. I, I encourage you to do that experiment. I should also tell you that um, our comp vermicompost came from uh, came from a commercial producer. It doesn't always work as well if you produce your own uh, vermicompost. So, uh, you should have in your vermicompost uh, food waste, obviously, um, uh, some wood chips, and uh, and in addition to that, you should also, when you produce a vermicompost, you should have uh, something high in nitrogen as well. So food waste would work. Uh, some people combine food food waste and and uh, manure. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's not liquid manure, but. Uh, 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 20% dry manure, so pretty dry manure. Uh, but yeah, I would use wood chips as well. That's, that was a good idea. That, that's an excellent idea. It will, will do the same thing. It, so it will play to all those scenarios that I said in the end. So it opens up, it opens up the structure. It allows more aeration, just like in a regular, in a regular um, pile, uh, thermophilic pile. But it also... Uh, adds nutrients, right? So they're not easy to, to get to, but I bet you that if you add vermicompost to it, that you get an increase of nutrients just from that. Great, thank you. Excellent question. Um, and Ollie actually had a similar question that was running around in my mind at the beginning. Um, so it's a, it's a two-part question. The first is, were the thermophilic and vermicompost used in the trials made with the same feedstocks? Because I think you had a line on that slide yeah, indicating that they were different. They were different, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so that's that's a, and that's a really good a good question. What mm -hmm. what would happen if you if they weren't the, if you used the same? So there's there's information in, in the literature about that. Uh, Debnea has a paper on on that as well. The same same. Uh, feedstock uh, and then vermicompost and thermophilic. And there's still a big difference in terms of the nitrogen okay. available. Yeah, because I know if the if, if you were comparing it to a thermophilic compost that wasn't made with, you know, like that was just leaf and yard waste debris, for example, you would anticipate that that nutrient profile be quite different than a manure based or a, feed, a food scrap right. based. So you, still have, you still have to aim at, at a C, C to N ratio of about yep. 30 to one. Yep. Uh, one um, thing, mm -hmm. one thing about that, uh, if, I, if I may just jump in there sure. uh, quickly. So I, I mentioned earlier that you might be able to retain some of the nutrients in a thermophilic pile, and I said mm -hmm. uh, no, it's, a, it's a long answer, <laughs> a long explanation of that. But maybe it's 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 not that that difficult. If you raise your C to N ratio, your starting C to N ratio from thirty to one to something like thirty five to one then more of the nitrogen is being retained because you have more, you have a higher C2N ratio. So you get more of the bacteria and fungi that are in your pile uh, to uh, immobilize that nitrogen. Mm -hmm. True. Um, okay, and then the, the other question there was, are there direct comparisons available of the P to N ratio and individual P and N concentration content 
for vermicompost, thermophilic compost, and bakashi compost, we, again, made with the same feedstocks. So maybe that was the, the reference to, to Debner's paper that you made. Uh, yeah, there's not, there's not much information on that at all because, uh, because vermicompost, commercial vermicompost is produced with cow manure and silage corn or silage, mm -hmm. uh, rotten silage that the corn couldn't feed to the cows. Um, and uh, Bokashi is usually produced uh, by, uh, with, with food waste, food waste and, and usually you add uh, some kind of um, uh, bran to it as well that you have prepared to, with right. certain microorganisms. So it's just totally different, uh, different beasts. Yeah, and I wonder if part of that may explain as well the difference that you were mentioning between a commercially produced vermicompost versus a you know sort of homemade quote unquote or backyard. Mm -hmm. Because like I know you mentioned Tom Gilbert, and he is definitely utilizing you know some of the the uh, food scrap. Um, yeah. uh, food scraps for his vermicompost. So I would anticipate that there'd be a different nutrient profile resulting from his vermicompost. Absolutely, there, and, and there's really not, not enough work on, on nutrient profiles. So one of the things that, that I was thinking when I was five years younger than I'm now, mm -hmm. <laughs> wiser, five years wiser now, uh, is, was that you know, we, have, we, have, we have these different processes, we have these different foods, uh, food, um, sorry, feedstocks for, uh, for producing composts. You know, and, and we can we can blend there's there's mm -hmm. ways of of changing the nutrient profiles of both of those to to some benefit so how about designer compost right so is, is there a way of of uh, being able to predict what you get out of blends of three or four different different finished composts um, and if I mean that that is something that maybe when I retire I will try and, and do that kind of thing but uh, in the, the regular yeah. uh, operations, it's almost impossible to, to spend that much time on something like that. Sure. And uh, Ollie just added related to adjusting the recipe to hold on to nitrogen. Um, she knows of a composter who had sulfur to lower the pH to prevent the gaseous end loss. So yeah. kind of so gets to those boutique recipes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So uh, designer boutique stuff. I think that's where it's at. You know, it's mm -hmm. it's whether you change the pH or whether you you add more uh, brown materials to increase the C to N ratio. Um, uh, it will help you retain some of those, mm -hmm. retain the nitrogen. Uh, I mean, the, it's just it's just a, a fact of life that nitrogen has that gaseous component, and you will lose some of that nitrogen uh, to the atmosphere when you're composting. It's just you just can't avoid that. Sure. Um, and we're right at the top of the hour, but I am going to, I think this question is just really quick um, because I think you had mentioned it. How, how long was the vermicompost combined with the thermophilic compost to get those results? Uh, it was 40 days. Okay. But uh, we did this, we, we measured, uh, so if I go back to, this is fast, I go back here, mm -hmm. right? So, mm -hmm. uh, if you look at the electric conductivity, just within days, within within three days, you have activated this 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 uh, this compost blend, right? So look how fast that goes. This is this is zero days. This is three days. You just it just goes so fast. It's just totally amazing. Great. All right. Well, we are out of time, but thank you so much, Joseph. And I, we're sorry that your colleague in Turkey wasn't able to join us, but we totally understand with the the significant time change. Um, and thank you to all of the participants for taking some time out of your afternoon to, to learn a little bit about Joseph's work. I yeah, would- for spending the time with me. It was fun. Yeah. And um, just a reminder that we are starting again tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. with the Soil Builders Compost-Based Best Management Practices for Erosion Prevention and Sediment Control. Um, so we will, and that kicks off um, the, you have four different uh, sessions for tomorrow. We hope you'll all be able to join us for, for part of that. And just a quick reminder that you will be getting a, an email with a link to an online evaluation at the end of the week. So if you could take just a couple minutes to fill that out, we would appreciate your feedback. And again, Joseph, thank you so much. My pleasure.
All right. Have a great afternoon, everybody. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.